This is HighIntensityBusiness.com with Lawrence Neal, helping you achieve your health and fitness goals. Become a great personal trainer and build your high-intensity strength training business. This episode is brought to you by ARX, the most innovative, efficient, and effective all-in-one exercise machines I have ever seen. I was really impressed with my ARX workout. The intensity and adaptive resistance was unlike anything I've ever experienced. I love how the machine enables you to increase the negative load to fatigue target muscles more quickly. And I love how the workouts are effortlessly quantified. The software tracks maximum force output, rate of work, total amount of work done and more in front of you on screen, allowing you to compete with your previous performance to give you and your clients real-time motivation. The ARX uses a computer-controlled motor to give you the exact amount of resistance your clients need 100% of the time. This means that the resistance can never become dangerous, is intuitive and simple to use, and can provide you with all of the results you and your clients are looking for in a fraction of the time. ARX is highly effective and efficient in delivering all of the benefits of exercise, including increased strength, muscle mass, cardiovascular conditioning, bone mineral density, and injury recovery. As well as being utilized by many high-intensity trainers to deliver highly effective and efficient workouts to their clients, ARX comes highly recommended by world-class trainers and brands, including Bulletproof, Tony Robbins, and Ben Greenfield Fitness. To find out more about ARX and get $500 off install when you place an order, please go to arxfit.com and mention HIB, that's High Intensity Business, in the How Did You Hear About Us field. So again, to get $500 off install when you place an order, head on over to arxfit.com and enter HIB in the How Did You Hear About Us field. Lawrence Neal here. Welcome back to highintensitybusiness.com. This is episode 271. And the topic of this episode is we're going to be talking about a scientific paper called The Strength Endurance Continuum Revisited, a critical commentary of the recommendation of different loading ranges for different muscular adaptations. And today's guest to talk about that is Dr. James Fisher. James is a course leader and senior lecturer uh, for the School of Sport, Health and, and Social Sciences at Southampton Solent University in the UK. He is regarded as one of the leading researchers in exercise science and in particular resistance training. James, welcome back to the podcast. Lawrence, thank you very much for having me. It's great to be back on. Yeah, yeah, it's, uh, it's my pleasure. And uh, thanks for taking the time. I'm excited <laughs> to dig into this and, and hopefully divert some some of our my listeners' attention away from what's happening in the world into something very interesting, um, and certainly from where I'm standing, it seems like a you know a big uh, a significant kind of investigation that's going to have real consequences. So you know, with that said, this is this is significant, isn't it? I mean, tell me about the the genesis of this paper. <sighs> Yeah, so so this is um, quite a quite been quite a big project for quite a long time, and it probably dates back to um, even 2011, where we published our evidence based resistance training recommendations, which maybe people will or will not know about. Um, and in it, we even talk about the difference between um, absolute and relative muscular endurance. Um, <clears throat> absolute being the number of repetitions at an absolute load, and relative being the number of repetitions at a given percentage of maximal. So, um, for, for, for example, if I just clarify that to begin with, um, yep. if somebody can, can lift 100 kilos, 70% of that is 70 kilos. Uh, if somebody improves their strength, um, their, their, one, their one repetition max to 120 kilos, then the absolute value is still 70 kilos. But the relative value is 70%. So that's now 84 kilos. So relative value always increases um, with, with maximal value. Um, and we talk about that in back in that 2011 paper. And we kind of say that actually, this is a big thing because absolute muscular endurance seems to change. Um, you know, you increase the number of repetitions with an absolute load, but you seldom increase the number of repetitions with a relative load. Um, so muscular endurance has always been a bit of a, a, a quizzical construct to talk about in my mind. So, you know, that, that sort of set me down the path of challenging this idea of 
training for muscular endurance. You know, why would people train for muscular endurance if we're not even really clear what we mean by it? Um, and then, of course, there's more and more research around strength and hypertrophy and adaptations at different loading ranges. So it just became um, it just became something that has sat on the back burner for a long time and and has eventually uh, uh, come out as this paper. And we've got a systematic review that's in, that's in the process of being finished as well right now. So. Right. Yeah. I um. It really did take me a while to get my head around absolute versus relative, which is maybe that's just me and I'm slow to to learn these things. But um, you know, I it's a common issue, right? Like, does it not just in exercise science, but in nutrition, in uh, lots of different fields? Um, people or, or papers are um misinterpreted by the media, and they just pull on the relative numbers, and then the relative make things look very different to what they actually are because they don't report on the absolute numbers. So this is like a really common problem and something I didn't, I didn't fully understand again, how to uh, understand, you know, uh, how to interpret relative versus absolute. I think I'm getting there. Um, I read your paper and it certainly helped me to do that. Um, and I'm, I'm sure myself and, and my listeners will have even better understanding by the end of this. Um, so let's, should we go through the paper and obviously we won't go line by line, but I figure the objective of this podcast, really, if we can just get a good um, uh, summary summary of the paper and talk about it as we go. Um, so, do you want to just start us off with uh, the introduction, and then we'll kind of go through go through the paper? Yeah, absolutely. So, the main thing around uh, the, the main sort of concept around the strength endurance continuum, um, and it's referred to by the NSCA as the repetition maximum continuum. So for the purpose of this podcast, I'm just going to use the term strength endurance continuum, because that was kind of the original term. Um, but the, the, the whole concept is that you use heavier loads to optimize strength adaptations, uh, more moderate loads for hypertrophy adaptations, and lighter loads for muscular endurance adaptations. And the guidelines by the ACSM and the NSCA, that's the American College of Sports Medicine and the National Strength and Conditioning Association, the guidelines are to train with a load um, equivalent or greater than 85% of 1RM, uh, which is equivalent to um, around about 6RM or less, so six repetitions or less for strength, um, 67 to 85% of 1RM, which is around 6 to 12 uh, RM, 6 to 12 repetition maximum for hypertrophy, and then a lighter load than that for muscular endurance. So less than 67%, um, which is equivalent to um, 12 repetitions or more. Um, that's, of course, assuming that a set is taken to failure. So six reps or less for strength, six to 12 reps for hypertrophy and more than 12 reps for muscular endurance. Um, and of course, that's been the, the, you know, that's been the accepted wisdom for a long time. I mean, I've worked with strength and conditioning coaches who still talk about periodizing their athlete for a strength phase or a hypertrophy phase or an endurance phase. And when they say that, they simply mean that they're adapting the load for the exercises they're using based on this principle. And more and more research has really gone against this concept. So it, it, it became an idea to kind of dig into this and look at wh where does all of this originate from? Um, mm -hmm. And that's kind of where, where this paper has, has come about. Um, so did you start, did you, so is, was that kind of the part of the catalyst for this? You started seeing papers being published, like single papers, uh, that that were kind of suggesting otherwise that actually this uh, this model wasn't quite true and that was kind of what catalyzed some of this. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So we've published papers that show that heavy and light loads produce similar strength adaptations. Yeah, 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 uh, and Brad Schoenfeld, uh, obviously, you know, prolific researcher in this area, has, has published similar research as well as um, hypertrophy, similar for strength and uh, for different loads. Um, and I mean, it culminated really in 2018, Brad published a meta-analysis where he showed that there was no difference really in strength adaptations for heavy and light loads and no difference in hypertrophy adaptations for heavy and light loads. So with that in mind, it has to, it has to, you know, really challenge this concept of the strength endurance continuum. If you can improve your strength with a light load, then you clearly don't need to use heavy loads and the same for hypertrophy. 
So that that was what that was probably the straw that don't, broke the donkey's back to say we really need to look at where this actually has come from. Um, and when you look at the origins of it, it's quite it's quite fascinating. So yeah, go on. Go if, if I get if I get into that briefly, is that okay? Yeah, I mean, just before you do, I actually was just going to say it's just mad to me how ingrained culturally the belief is around. Um, these these ranges uh, specifically lighter loads for local muscular endurance. I mean that is a, that is just so ingrained and so entrenched so deeply in in everyone's psyche um, in exercise that I know that and people have been talking about that for decades. You know even when I was first getting into exercise, so it's uh, it's just fascinating to kind of look at that actually and go, is that true? And then obviously the evidence suggests it isn't. Um, and I know excited to, to dig into this. So yeah, James, please go ahead, mate. Uh, well, just just sticking with that point, yeah. I mean, it's it's just crazy to think that um, lighter loads for muscular endurance. And of course, I mean, I'm a cyclist, so the triathletes and the cyclists that I've worked with will always come back to me and say, "Well, I don't what, I don't lift heavy weights. I do sort of twenty to twenty five reps of an exercise." <laughs> uh, and I and I sort of think, "Well, why?" and and in fact, my research around discomfort um, has really been a key a key part of looking at this lighter load exercise. I'm not specifically for or against heavy or light loads. I don't really care what people use, but I would hate to train with a light load because it it sucks. It's boring. It's Horrible. painful. <laughs> Um, yeah, it's just not enjoyable. I would much rather, uh, you know, if you said to me, you can do a one rep max or a 50 rep max, I would choose a one rep max every single time. Short, maximal effort contractions, uh, way, you know, way more preferable for me personally, and probably for most people, if I'm honest. So, yeah, 100%. Um, yeah. So, so the, the 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 origins of this kind of strength endurance continuum. If you get if you really get into the research, um, it dates back to a guy um, Thomas Delorme, who was a, a captain, and I think he may have been promoted higher than that in the U.S. military. Um, so, and and he is actually considered one of the founding sort of fathers of progressive resistance exercise as we know it, um, Captain Thomas Delorme. Um, and his his research dates back to sort of 1945, 1947, 48 of the three papers that um, that I'm going to sort of talk about today. Um, and what I mean, the first thing is he published this idea, and uh, and most people look at his work or talk about him and say, oh, but but this guy showed that. To improve strength, you lift a heavy weight for a short number of repetitions. And to improve endurance, you lift a lighter weight for a higher number of repetitions. And that, you know, is, is the, the, the foundation of this strength endurance continuum. But when you actually get into his research, the first thing that stands out is actually he was looking at rehabilitating injured veterans from the war. So he wasn't working with trained athletes or untrained persons. He was looking at rehabilitation, which might be slightly different in itself. And then the next thing that comes around is he wasn't looking at, at um, muscular endurance. He was actually looking at what you would probably refer to as aerobic endurance. Um, and he even gives the examples in his papers of um, stair climbing, walking, bicycling and similar low resistance exercises. And that's, uh, that's a direct quote from him. So he, he's never talking about light load resistance training. He's talking about what we would consider aerobic or cardiovascular exercise, which makes sense. If you want to improve, you know, your cardiovascular exercise, you probably would go and do cardiovascular exercise, partly for the specificity of doing it in the skill element, but also because of the prolonged duration and, and so forth. If you want to improve muscular strength, you would go the opposite way and lift a heavy weight um, or a relatively heavy weight for a given number of repetitions. And that, and it's and it's really that simple. There was a complete misinterpretation of his research um, over the past. Well, you know, I mean, this, these are dated 1945, so we're talking about 70 years now. You know, 75 years. But the strength endurance continuum, as the NSCA and the ACSM cite them, have has been around for 
probably 30 years now or more anyway so yeah yeah go on sorry yeah we'll, we'll i want to get into their reaction uh, we'll perhaps talk about that towards the end i think it'd be best if we went through the paper chronologically kind of how you are so let's let's do that first shall we yeah of course yeah so so i mean you know if we've the foundation of this, as we consider it, as, as Delorme's strength endurance continuum, is immediately, you know, the foundation is rattled straight away because it's all built on misinterpretation. <laughs> yeah. and, and, I, and I went back to these papers and, and read them with a fine tooth comb because once I'd got a copy of them, I, I actually couldn't believe how, how clearly they'd been misinterpreted. Um, you know, they they even in the 1948 paper, they even say it's become apparent the term heavy resistance exercise bears false implications. And we should use the term progressive resistance exercise. And and that's where this term has come from. And that's what people know of today. Um, in another of the papers, they even say that um, they guide people to uh, three sets of 10 repetitions, the magical, mystical three sets of 10 reps. But they even go on to say that the sets should be performed um, slowly and controlled without explosive movements um, and so forth, which, of course, flies you know, brilliantly with high intensity training <laughs> cuts. Um, but they even go on to say that the first set is uh, should be performed with 50% of 10 RM, so basically a warm-up set. The next set is 75% of 10 RM, so kind of a second warm-up set. And then the final the final set should be a 10 repetition maximum. So effectively, they're saying, perform, or, or, or Delorme, Thomas Delorme was saying, perform exercise um, smoothly, rhythmically, without haste, uh, avoid quick or sudden movements, um, do two warm-up sets of 10 repetitions, progressing the load between those two sets, and then do a single set to muscular failure. And it's mind-blowing how that became, do three sets of 10. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, um, you know, the, it, this is this is part of it, isn't it? We We, people look at research and they take what they want to take from it and then they run with it and run with it and run with it until people have forgotten what the original research was so this this uh, yeah just just go back on that in terms of the way it's written in your paper and obviously you've quoted from his that's almost like a pyramid right like uh you know like you're scaling up the load yeah over the sets yeah okay i got that right okay yeah yeah absolutely and and to be fair it makes sense for anybody with an injury because you don't want to just suddenly give them a, 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 a arguably relatively heavy load um, because you don't know how their skeletal system or their you know tendons or ligaments or injured muscles might respond to lifting that weight. So you might use a lighter weight um, to kind of warm them up and prepare them for that exercise and so forth, as you might do with an untrained person anyway, or as some people might do in performing a warm up anyway. So. It's not. It's not ridiculous to think of it that way. So, yeah, I think also this is probably quite relevant right now with a lot of people training with free weights and body weight from home. Maybe they're struggling to do a single set to failure. I know I do, especially on some of the lower body stuff. Um, and so, some some kind of um, creativity around pre exhaust and just just programming in your workouts can be can be really useful. And it's it's interesting how uh, we'll get into obviously how you know failure and effort really are the key variables here and we'll, we'll probably talk about that towards the end and get some of your recommendations james um but did you want to sorry i, I kind of butted in there but do you want to just push on with the paper uh yeah absolutely can do mm -hmm. so i mean the, the key thing there is complete misinterpretation of the origins of the strength endurance continuum um you know i want like i said once you look at that the, the foundations of it are really really shaken um just mm -hmm. to quickly talk about thomas delorme um, he also went on to talk about something called double progression, which most people will know of as if you're, for example, training with an eight to 12 repetition maximum, then um, that's your kind of rep range. Then as you get stronger and stronger, the number of repetitions you can perform um, generally goes up. So instead of it being instead of you ceasing exercise at 12 reps, you might be able to get 14 reps or 15 reps or 16 reps. So the number of repetitions you can do has progressed. The element of double progression is you then 
take a step back with the repetitions, but you progress the load. So now you might increase the load back to a point where you can only perform eight repetitions. So you increase the load, but decrease the repetitions. And that's the principle of double progression. Um, and Delorme is kind of often uh, credited with that. Um, although I looked into this a bit more and um, Mike Petrella helped me uh, dig back to Muscle Smoke and Mirrors. Um, by Randy Roach and found that it, it originated probably before that. Um, but even the concept of double progression is a bit of a paradox because it suggests that if you want to continue increasing strength, you have to increase the load to go back to a repetition range. And yet the fact that you increased strength by exceeding a repetition range. Um, so it, it, it's, it's almost bizarre in itself. And it's far more likely that that's for time efficiency or comfort yeah. or other psychosocial reasons rather than just to improve maximal strength. Um, so, you know, that in itself is is quite interesting. So just, just um, on that, just on that, if, if I may, um, you know, I, I, I underline that myself and run a highlight for it because I just wanted to bring it up. Um, yeah, so there's obviously a, a it makes sense from a time efficiency point of view if you continue to stay within that rep range and, and increase load accordingly. Um, and but at the end of the day, I mean, I know I'm diverting off this paper a little bit, um, but it's it's all about just getting to momentary muscular failure, right? And however one decides they want to do that is 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 fine, and it, it doesn't matter whether one doesn't increase that load and instead just continues to increase the repetitions. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I completely agree. And a prime example for, some, for this is something like pull-ups or press-ups, which is the staple yeah. of my workout right now. You know, I can't, I'm not in a position to add external load um, without great difficulty. So, you know, if I can do 12 press-ups today and I can do 14 press-ups next week, then that ha then that's indicative of a, of a sort of a strength increase. And if I was in the gym and that was a bench press or a chest press, I would be encouraged to increase the load. But if there wasn't a heavier weight, then I would just simply carry on going with the weight that I'm using and hopefully get more repetitions each successive workout or as my sort of strength yeah. increased. Um, and so, yeah, the idea of reaching muscular failure and recruiting all available motor units and, and stimulating adaptation in that way, maybe through metabolic stress and, and, and other markers, is is key. So the, the external load being used doesn't seem to be the key driver in all of this. Yeah, I mean, this is so just to give you a heads up, James, I'm going to be probably interrupting you during as we get through this paper with questions like this. Um, so, you know, why is it, though, that the meme of progressive overload is just so um, prevalent, you know, even in the hit community, which always surprises me, um, but obviously it's very, very pre prevalent in the um, over, overall sort of fitness community. I mean, you see it everywhere still, right? Is it, I mean, is it just psychological, like people, like, because there is obviously a psychological component. People like to see their weights go up, their time under load go up, their reps go up. Um, but yeah, I, I, I mean, just for your thoughts on that, yeah. Yeah, I would argue that it's exactly that. And I'm guilty of it in the same way. Um, you know, I think that, that I, I love the idea of, ha of lifting a heavier weight. So, you know, for me, a marker of my strength of my muscular performance is how much weight I can lift for a given number of repetitions, whatever that number of repetitions might be, whether it's a 1RM or a 10RM or whatever it might be. Um, and I don't tend to think about... Um, my muscular performance in insofar as how many repetitions can I do with an absolute load? So e.g. how many pull-ups or how many press-ups can I do? Um, you know, I would tend to think how much more weight can I add? But it's it's purely psychological. And and to some extent, this lends itself to some of the um, Nautilus equipment that Arthur developed in the 70s, um, in, in the later 70s, where he looked at, I think it was in the later 70s, where he looked at infometric with the idea where there wasn't a weight stack at all. You simply resisted the movement with the opposing limb. And none of it, none of it took off at all because people want to see a weight move up and down. It's not enough to know the muscle is maximally contracting. Um, it, it, it's about the psychological element of seeing a weight move. 
Um, so, yeah, I, I just it's, think that it, I, I think it's that simple, really. It's very, it's interesting because it's also, it is, it, this transfers to some of the, the higher tech equipment, right? Like ARX, people love to see their, their force output improve over time. Um, and the other variables that they might track on like an ARX machine or the Vive uh, machine or, or any one of these um, that they show, you know, a, a display, which, you know, there's obviously ongoing debate about, you know, data, a digital data versus seeing a weight go up and down. And I guess we're yet to know, you know, what's most stimulating for people. Um, unless you, I don't know, you've got any thoughts on that? Yeah, and I think that the more tech savvy people will will like you know will like the things like ARX and um, and the people that understand it will like the use of um, uh, of any isokinetic equipment that can measure the actual maximal force produced. Um, I, personally, I, I, that's one of the reasons I really like the concept. Um, because ultimately I don't need to see a weight go up and down. I don't need that external load um, that makes resistance equipment particularly expensive or heavy um, and provides resistance in a, you know, in a cheap machine. It's the, it's the weight stack moving up and down the guide rod that provides a lot of you know resistance to the machine um, or friction, I should say. So you know, we can use isokinetic equipment and it can do the job without without this external load because it can give us an, an immediate feedback of a numerical value. Absolutely. So the next part of this paper is the repetition maximum continuum. Am I, am I on the right, right track there? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so basically the, the NSCA used the term repetition maximum continuum rather than strength endurance continuum. And, and it's, it's essentially the same thing, you know, in the paper that I go, I go on to say, you know, in their, in their main textbook from, uh, I don't know how old now, they've always cited this, this uh, repetition maximum continuum as a table and you can Google it and find it. And it's the, like I said, it's the accepted wisdom in, uh, in strength training. Um, <clears throat> and you would think that something so heavily cited has, you know, an, an absolute mountain of research around it because because it's so, you know, so often cited. Um, yeah. But actually, this is this was the interesting part. We looked at the tables that they produce, and, and in the in the article we talk about a table. It's table seventeen point nine on page four hundred and fifty eight of Essentials of Strength Training and Conditioning. And it, and it gives all this information. It says about strength and hypertrophy and muscular endurance. But then it, it cites the references that allegedly support this table. And they, they cite eight references, um, two of which are textbooks. Um, and textbooks are not empirical studies. So they can't be considered equivocal data to support this, this continuum, this, print, this premise. Um, uh, a third one is a chapter from a book. So again, it's the same thing. Um, and I'm not having a, a complete go at people that write books, but the problem with a book on an area is it's given a lot more leeway to have a bias of the author's opinion. Um, I'm not saying that it does always have that, but I'm saying it has leeway to do that. And it also becomes relatively dated because of the time um, from the submission of the uh, of the manuscript to the actual publication. Um, but anyway, two textbooks and a chapter from a book, and then two further of these eight citations are commentary articles or um, a recommendation article. So basically, somebody that's written a piece that says, oh, you should follow this. Again, they didn't actually do any research to look at it. So five of the eight citations are unfortunately completely redundant as far as supporting the, the strength endurance continuum. Um, the other three, the first of which is a f very, very famous article by Berger in 1962, um, and he looked at bench press strength um, in 199 male college students following 12 weeks of training. And he looked at people performing different training with different loads and some trained with a very heavy load of just a two rep max and some trained with a far more moderate load of a 12 rep max. Uh, and he found that the only training load that was statistically better than the other groups was the group that did a 10 RM. So they improved their maximal strength more than the 2 RM and more than the 12 RM. 
Um, so that in itself doesn't support the idea for heavy loads being better for maximal strength. Um, the other two studies, uh, one by Herrick and Stone in 1986, compared progressive resistance exercise to periodized resistance exercise in untrained females. Um, the periodized used um, kind of an undulating load design, the progressive used an increasing load design, um, but they found no differences between the groups anyway. And then the final study, which is a really interesting study, is by um, a couple of Scandinavian authors called Tesh and Larson. And they looked at, um, this was a completely observational study. They didn't do any kind of training with their, with their participants. Um, they looked at um, quadriceps and shoulder uh, muscle hypertrophy. So they, they took biopsies and they actually took them from three competitive Scandinavian bodybuilders and they compared them to um, uh, physical education students, sort of high school or collegiate students, um, and to um, national weightlifters. And they actually found that there was no difference in the in the actual muscle size. Um, and they they even the quote that I include in the paper from their paper was, um, we did not observe any sign of individual muscle fiber enlargement in either thigh or shoulder muscles of successful bodybuilders. Thus, despite the considerably greater body weight per height and less body fat in bodybuilders compared to habitually trained and age matched, mean fiber area did not differ. So, that, you know, and, and that's interesting in itself, saying that bodybuilders don't have bigger muscle fibers than weightlifters or um, PE students, um, that there's simply a difference in body composition and, and so forth and, and other kind of morphological adaptations. I don't um, understand the relevance of that one. I, I tr I've read that through a number of times and listened to you there, and I don't understand the relevance that has in their, in their argument at all. Um, am I missing something? Yeah. No, not at all. Not at all. You're right. absolutely okay. right to question the inclusion of that and you and we can only take an assumption from this so really what they're saying is they're saying hey here's some bodybuilders here's some weightlifters and here's some untrained pe students how do they differ in muscle size well what we don't know is their pre-existing training routines right. we can only we can only assume that the weightlifters um, the competitive weightlifters lift heavy weights for a, a fewer number of repetitions, and that the bodybuilders perform a larger volume of sort of three or more sets of six to twelve repetitions, um, but they never say that. They 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 never actually clarify that that that's their pre-existing training routine. So. One, the evidence that they're presenting in the muscle fiber size doesn't support a strength and endurance continuum. But two, it bears almost no relevance because we don't know what kind of workout they're doing anyway, even if it did lend itself to a strength and endurance continuum. This episode is brought to you by our sponsor, ARX. Are you looking to create a cutting edge, high intensity training facility? Are you confused on what equipment to use or how to separate yourself from the masses? Well, then ARX Fit might be the answer you're looking for. I asked Mike Palano from ARX a few questions about how ARX machines are challenging the status quo of the exercise industry around the globe. Mike, if you could, give the listeners a quick summary of why ARX is so different from the traditional machines or tools they're used to seeing in most exercise facilities. ARX is totally different than anything you've seen before. This isn't just another weight stack machine. We've looked at the last 40 years of exercise technology and used that knowledge to create something entirely new. ARX uses a new form of resistance, a motor, and we pair that motor with computer software so that we can maximize the safety, effectiveness, and efficiency of your workouts. So you may be asking, okay, but how does ARX compare to weights? Traditional machines you see in gyms today are based on lifting metal weights and battling gravity. What people don't realize is that when you're forced to lift a static weight like this, one that doesn't adapt or change while you use it, you're underloading yourself rep after rep. And this unnecessarily limits your ability to make improvements. With ARX, we've taken a totally different approach. 
we removed weights and gravity from the equation altogether. Instead, ARX combines our patented motorized resistance with our custom computer software to provide you with the world's safest, most effective, and most quantified form of resistance training ever. When you train with ARX, you are training to your perfect level of resistance, both positively and negatively 100% of the time. No more guessing what weight to use, ARX does all of that for you, instantly and automatically. We'll also track and measure every second of every rep, so you can quantify all of your workouts to find out if you're improving and by exactly how much. Whether your goals are bigger muscles, increased strength, stronger bones, or just to look good in a bathing suit, ARX can help you achieve all of these and more, but do so in a fraction of the time it would take compared to traditional equipment. If you're looking for the most efficient, most effective, and most quantified piece of exercise equipment on the market today, then look no further than ARX. Thanks, Mike. That all sounds really impressive. If you'd like to learn more about ARX, visit arxfit.com and mention that you heard about ARX on the High Intensity Business Podcast to receive an exclusive deal of $500 of shipping and installation of your ARX machines. Before we get on to the actual support for Repetition Maximum Continuum, I feel like this is going to sound really harsh, but I feel like this is the laziest job ever. It's so unscientific um, in terms of what they did. Um, it's like a bad, a really, really bad dissertation at you know, graduate level. You know, like not maybe even college level. Like I just, I feel like I feel like it's really lazy. Am I am I off the mark there? I mean, it's just it's just well, so unscientific to me. Yeah. No, I, I would tend to agree with you. I would tend to agree with you. And the big problem with this is, a, as a textbook like this just ultimately becomes updated, um, and so with no disrespect to the to the newer authors, which are Half and Tripler, Greg Half, uh, who's now the head of the NSCA, um, who I met at a conference in uh, in November, um, and, and seems like a, a genuinely really nice guy, and I'm sure is a, I'm sure is a, a good scientist. Um, but he um, is more of a practitioner, so he's probably more involved in the um, applied elements than the research element. But his name has been okay. the lead kind of editor of this this book. The previous authors of the book were um, uh, Thomas Beechel and Earl, uh, Beechel and Earl, uh, for I think two editions. Um, and the problem is when a textbook like this is updated, People probably don't go back and check the existing references. They probably just add to it. So, you know, you can't... That's terrible. Yeah. That's yes, not evidence-based. That is just not evidence-based. I, and I agree with you. I agree with you. But I think... That, drive you guys mad. Yeah. I mean, it's, to be honest, it's somewhat, it's somewhat expected that there's a degree of laziness when it comes to... Um, textbooks like this. And it's why I would always urge my students to stay clear of textbooks um, with some exceptions. Um, but for the most part, a textbook that's had multiple editions published probably has seldom been kind of reviewed for its for its uh, academic rigor um, and, and, you know, the scientific quality of the, the existing citations. Um, you know, with the exception of what the law of running uh, by Tim Noakes, where he completely changed his thinking on carbohydrate intake. Um, and, and I think one of his later editions was almost a completely paleo approach. So, um, but yeah, yeah. so it, it does drive us crazy, um, us being academics. Um, but I mean, it's almost expected a little bit. I mean, these references themselves are sort of 1982, 1986, um, when was the Berger 1962? You know, none of these references are, are in the last 20 years. So that in itself is a bit of a red flag that they're just citing the same thing that they've always cited. So, yeah, fascinating stuff. Um, all right, so we're on to the next section support for RM continuum. Yeah, so so then it, it becomes interesting because what, one of the things that they could have done is cited some of the papers that do support a, uh, a repetition maximum or a strength and endurance continuum. Um, and there are three main studies that are cited, um, Anderson and Kearney, um, Stone and Coulter, and Campos. 
So the Anderson and Kearney publication looked at um, three different training groups. Uh, it was untrained males divided into three training groups. They have a heavy load group doing three sets of six to eight uh, rep max, a moderate load group doing two sets of 30 to 40 rep max. That was considered a moderate load for this study. <laughs> And a light load group, which performed one set of 100 to 150 repetitions. <laughs> and the key with, with that study that's interesting is they tried to kind of um, model it on typical strength, hypertrophy or endurance training. Um, so if you're doing a heavy weight, a very heavy weight, you might do more sets. If you're doing a very light weight, you might do only a single set. Um, and of course, that lends itself to training time as well. If you're doing a single set of 100 repetitions, then that probably is closer in time to three sets of six to eight. So the authors, you know, which were trying to, they were trying to answer a question, which is really important. Um, they found, I mean, the, the problem really is the study design doesn't doesn't really answer what it's trying to do. Do we use heavy loads for strength and lighter loads for endurance? Um, because they, I mean, now that we know that discomfort is so much greater in lighter loads, you know, you could arguably say the moderate load and the light load group probably never reached muscular failure and therefore never reached the same motor unit recruitment um, because they just were in so much discomfort prior to that. Um, they, they did report some statistical differences. So they uh, reported that the um, heavy load group improved strength greater than the light load group, I think, um, and that the light load group improved repetitions more than the heavy load group. But I think there wasn't much of a difference between the heavy load and the moderate load group for strength and the uh, moderate load and the light load group for muscular endurance um, and they measured um let me just double check they measured absolute muscular endurance um so the same load pre and post intervention um so i mean you know there is some potentially weak support for a strength and endurance continuum there but i would argue that it's not um it, it's not it's not robust um, you know, the heavy load group Im improved their one repetition max by 13 uh, kilos. Um, but the number of repetitions that they were able to perform at 40% of their, you know, pre-intervention 1RM, you know, sort of barely changed. Well, if somebody improves their strength quite considerably over nine weeks, you would expect the number of repetitions they can perform at a given load to 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 change in accordance with it um and and they didn't really see that so i think that i mean it's a dated study i'm not trying to take anything away from the researchers i think they were doing a nice job with what they tried to do but i i think that they i think that knowing now what we know about rigidity in science about truly training to muscular failure about maybe controlling repetition duration and things like that that you know that study could be replicated um with better control over some of the variables yeah absolutely if that, if that makes sense yeah no it does it does um so what's the next one stone and coulter so the next one was stone and coulter um and as i recall they actually um didn't report any difference between in one rm improvements or absolute muscular endurance between the three groups so they had three groups again so similar study design um three sets of six to eight RM for the heavy load, two sets of 15 to 20 RM for the, for the moderate load, and one set of 30 to 40 RM for the light load. And they looked at bench press and back squat, and they, they effectively found that there were no differences between the, the three groups, uh, between the three groups in strength and absolute muscular endurance. And it's, it's interesting that this is then often used to support the idea of a strength and endurance continuum and it is used to support it but they actually didn't really find any difference or any statistically significant differences um people will look at the percentage change and they might even calculate effect sizes which might marginally favor 
one group over another for strength or endurance. But certainly these authors didn't didn't really report data to support one group over another for improving maximal strength or absolute muscular endurance. Right, okay. So it's so a little that, laziness there from the NSCA and ACSM. Well, yeah. I mean, the NSCA and the ACSM don't actually cite that, from what I recall. They don't, they don't cite it very often. They, did, they certainly didn't cite it to support their table that we talked about earlier. But they, um, but it is used a lot to sort of support it. But that brings us on to the final study, Campos et al. from 1992, as I recall. And this is the the often cited paper. Um, I think I I think I googled um, how often this paper was cited, and it was just off the chart. I mean, it, it just is. It, it seems like every man and his dog has read or, or maybe not read, but cited this paper. Cherry picked it, probably. <laughs> Potentially so, um, yeah. but it, but it, but it, it's really the only paper that supports a strength and endurance continuum. And, and first and foremost, it's actually the only paper that really looked at low load, moderate load, and light load training. So the low rep group was three to five RM, the moderate load group was nine to eleven RM, and the high rep group was twenty to twenty eight rep max. Um, it's also the only study where they measured strength and muscle hypertrophy. So of all of these other studies that we've talked about, none of them have actually used a rep range that falls similar to the NSCA or the ACSM have talked about, and none of them have, have measured muscular hypertrophy, which when we look back at the, the actual recommendations that you should train with 6 to 12 RM or 1 to 6 RM for strength, um, 6 to 12 RM for hypertrophy, well, this is the only study that's looked at that, um, or greater than 12 RM for muscular endurance. The other studies have done like, what, 100 to 150 RM or, you know, 30 to 40 RM. You know, they're, they're not, they're, they're not, the, the numbers that the NSCA and the, and the ACSM are citing are kind of almost picked from thin air, I guess. Um there's there's no there's certainly no real underpinning for using those rep ranges or those loads. Anyway, the Campos et al. paper did did generally support uh, uh, a strength endurance continuum. The group that trained with very heavy loads with the three to five RM improved their maximal strength. The group that trained with lighter loads improved their muscular endurance. Um, there wasn't much change in um, muscle fiber size between the heavy load and the moderate load group. So, um, you know, arguably um, that, that, uh, that, that idea of training with uh, heavy loads only improves strength or doesn't improve hypertrophy to the same degree is kind of lost a little bit. Um, the, um, you know, the group seem to produce similar increases in in hypertrophy. Um, so so really, it's interesting to sort of look at why the strength, the maximal, or sorry, the heavy load group improved their maximal strength and and actually decreased the number of repetitions. Now, one of the things that's worth saying about this paper. Sorry, I feel like I'm I'm going on already. No, it's fine. Um, one of the things about this paper is they don't report any raw data. And I contacted the authors, and of course, it's an old paper, and the authors said they just they they couldn't send me the data; they don't have it anymore. So uh, that's not to say that they wouldn't, or there was anything uh, you know behind that. They just simply didn't didn't have it, and they didn't report it in the paper. Um, what we did, myself and James Steele and colleagues, we used um, a, a web plot digitizer software where you can kind of put the graph in and it will give you the kind of estimated values and estimated changes. Um, and we, we even report this in the paper and we sort of talk about the idea that there was, you know, you know, they report there's no differences in the pre-intervention strength. And we support that by saying, yes, it was probably around about this. Um, beforehand and there was around about this change for the groups but but i mean for a group to improve their let me see their leg press strength the heavy load group improved their leg press strength by um 61 percent 
they improved their leg press strength from around 310 kilos to around um, 498 kilos. Mm -hmm. So that's a pretty drastic improvement in strength. So if if you'd seen that improvement in strength and I then put you back on a light load and asked you how many repetitions you can get a, a light load, I would expect you to get more repetitions than you did the, before the intervention. Yeah, this yet, confused the hell out of me. Go on. Yeah. And yet they report that the people that got that much stronger actually got fewer, were able to perform fewer repetitions at the end of their intervention. So, um, I mean, it was an eight-week intervention. Participants trained twice a week for the first four weeks and three times a week for the next four weeks. But if I've improved my one rep max from 310 to 498 kilos, if you now give me um, a, a, um, a test of muscular endurance, I, I'm shocked to think that somebody's muscular endurance would go down with that. It, it just doesn't compute in, in my head. Um, so, you know, that's bizarre. And then the same is true for the, or the opposite is true for the lighter load group. So the lighter load group, um, let, me, let me just find the data, the high rep, they were called low rep and high rep. So the high rep group had an estimated uh, pre-intervention 1RM of 300 kilos. And um, post-intervention 1RM of 364 kilos. And yet they saw an improvement in 68 repetitions. They saw a 94% improvement in muscular endurance. Yeah. So they've improved their strength quite considerably. Um, I think the authors report it at 20%, but we, uh, or they report it at 32, but we calculated it at 21%. 300 to 364 is around a 21% improvement. But they saw a 94% improvement in muscular endurance. Yeah. So, is, this why, is this why you think uh, this paper is so often cited? Because these numbers don't seem right. And obviously, <clears throat> to follow the scientific method, you, 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 know, you might think that, but you have to really obviously go into the, 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 you know, the, the details is which you will. Um, but, but I'm just thinking like, it's such an easy target for people who have a bias to, um, you know, the, um, conventional thinking around this. And um, because it, it, you know, it's like, it, it shows with the, the higher load group actually having a, a worse performance in, in endurance and number of repetitions. It's just, it's, it's such a powerful statement. Um, Maybe powerful statements is the wrong way of putting it because the the, the study is is fraught with, um, with with issues that we, we we're talking about here and we're going to go into. But you know what I mean. On the surface of it, it looks really compelling. It's like wow, they performed really badly in terms of muscular endurance, um, and uh, and look how much better. Look how much better the improvement was for the low rep group in terms of muscular endurance. Like it's just significant differences. If, yeah, if no, I've so, interpreted that right, yeah. No, sorry, it wasn't the low rep group it was the it was a, it was Sorry, a high, rep, high rep group i mean the high rep group that improved the endurance so drastically so if, if you were to ask me which group would i want to be in if those if that data is accurate and we take it at face value which there's no reason why we shouldn't but if you if you say to me you can improve your maximal strength by this much but your muscular endurance will drop off quite considerably or you can improve your maximal strength by only 20 percent but your muscular muscular endurance will go through the roof by 94 percent well i'm going to tell you i'm going to train with a light load you know every time sure. um but i mean that's me personally because i can see the value of sort of muscular endurance um and we seldom perform maximal feats of strength um so i wouldn't want to improve my maximal strength at the detriment of any degree of muscular endurance. And it doesn't make sense to me that that would even occur. You know, I can't, you know, if I practically picture myself getting on a leg press and being able to leg press 60% more load, so a change from um, 310 kilos to 498 kilos, I can't imagine that if I then went back to that 300 kilo load, 310 kilo load, I would get yeah, fewer repetitions silly. than I did beforehand. You know, that yeah. doesn't make sense. Um, so it, 
I, I don't know. There's some the data in there is is a little bit is a is a little bit questionable from the point of view of I think um, more information is needed. And the, and the thing is, it's a it's a really thorough piece of research because they looked at cardiorespiratory endurance as well. They looked at VO2 max and they looked at muscle hypertrophy and, and biopsies in, you know, type one, two A and type two B muscle fibers. And there were multiple tests of lower body strength. I think there were knee extension, back squat and leg press. So it was really c- quite comprehensive from that point of view. But but all, they're almost it was almost at the detriment of detail for data and you know what they actually did from a methodological point of view so um you know it would be really fascinating to speak to the authors properly and find out exactly what was done over the data collection and 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 so forth and how it was how they were tested and so forth so yeah um yeah i mean just before we i mean there's more obviously to talk about this on this paper but i i I made a note um there was no hypertrophy in the high RM group. Um, I just wondered why that was. Is that because they just simply didn't go to a high enough level of effort and go to failure? Yeah. So they said that the um, the, the low the the low rep, so the heavy load, and the uh, intermediate rep, so the moderate load group, showed similar increases in. Um, Type one, two A, and two B muscle fibers, um, but no differences in the in the lighter load, and of course, that just happens to support everything that the NSCA say that you know if you train with a light <laughs> load, you can you, you know you don't improve hypertrophy and so forth. In reality, I, I can imagine that if somebody was performing the twenty to twenty eight rep max. Um, twice a week for four weeks and then three times a week for four weeks for these leg exercises for back squat, leg press and knee extension. They're probably in in quite a lot of soreness. Um, they're probably in quite a lot of discomfort during the exercise. Um, I, I would not be motivated to be in that group. Um, so it's then interesting to see that they showed such good strength and endurance improvements without any muscular hypertrophy along with that. And, and like I said, the key with all of this is when you get into the studies that have gone, that have come since this one, they all show similar hypertrophy between heavy and light loads. Right. You know, the, the, pa- the papers by Cameron Mitchell and Rob Morton and Stu Phillips, uh, Stu Phillips's group um, and by Brad Schoenfeld and Cal. And is that, is that because they've, I, I have to, review those papers but is that because they've used a uh, for the lighter loads in those papers they've used actually reasonable repetition ranges and no in the Stu Phillips studies they use use sort of 30 percent of one rep max so they were probably performing they were probably even performing more than 20 or 28 reps how Um, are they then controlling that to be able to make sure people did go to failure if they did if I've understood that right well, arguably, how do you ever control somebody going to failure? <laughs> right. Um, you know, if, yeah, if, I, if I stand in the gym with you, uh, how do I know that you've reached true muscular failure or vice versa? So we can only we can only hope that the participant is motivated enough to really do that um, and, and, and so forth. So, you know, we, and again, we can't know in this study whether they did or didn't. We can only take it at face value and say they trained to a repetition maximum, 20 to 28 RM, and they were training to the same degree of effort um, as the heavy and more moderate load groups. Um, I, I think that they, yeah, the data might be explained by the fact that maybe they weren't training to the same degree of effort, but that's only supposition. We can never truly know that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm just looking at my diary to see when my uh, call is with Stuart Phillips. Uh, I've got a Q&A in the membership. I want to say next week. Um, 28th. 28th. <laughs> yeah, we're, I'm looking at it. I'm trying to... Oh, yeah, there it was covered up by something out of my screen. Yeah, there you go. 2 p.m. our time. Uh, are you are you registered for that, are you? I, I am indeed. Oh, good yeah, man. Good man. Yeah, me too. Um, so we can ask him then. That'll be, that'll be fun. Um, but uh, but yeah, if you're if you're listening to this and you're thinking I'd like to be on a Q and A with Stuart Phillips PhD, who wouldn't? Then uh, please consider joining the membership, highintensitybusiness.com forward slash membership. Um, okay, so back to <laughs> no shameless plug. Um, 
back to this study then. Um, we're at, we're at, we're talk, we're now at effort and discomfort. I don't think we've really got into that yet. Is that fair enough? Yeah, and this yep. is just something that's really worth touching on because one of the things that, that we've sort of shown and we've talked about quite a lot is the idea that as the as the load that you train with decreases, so as you use a lighter load, your your degree of discomfort probably increases. The studies that we've done looking at things like the knee extension and the uh, low back and things like that, we've certainly shown a higher degree of discomfort in participants when they train with a light load, um, albeit that they make similar strength adaptations to, to participants training with a heavy load. Um, and so one of the things that we sort of wanted to highlight here is that if people are training with a light load, because ultimately, you know, if you get the same adaptations in strength, endurance or hypertrophy, then people can self-select the load that they train with. But it's worth knowing that you might not get the same adaptations with a very, very light load because you might be less likely to reach muscular failure. Um, and, and that's kind of the, the key point around that. Um you know, I can't imagine being in one of the studies, the Anderson and Kearney with the, with the 100 to 150 repetitions or Stone and Coulter with the 30 to 40 repetition maximum. Um, you know, I just, I, I, I almost in my head, I almost can't believe that participants in those groups really trained to failure. I feel like once they were within that rep range, they were almost encouraged to stop. I can imagine people getting to... 40 repetitions and saying I could do more and and the research is saying no 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 stop there because you're in the right rep range if you do more then you'll need to go into the other rep you know the the other training group sure. so I I just think that it's something worth talking about and ultimately ultimately all of this is about is about the academic and scientific research with the practical element because practitioners um, at whether they're a, a trainer or a trainee, really want to know how they can use this research. That's what it's all about. It's not about, you know, just researchers doing research for, for, for the sake of it. It's about what it means practically. And I think that when we look at effort and discomfort, we can take a far more pragmatic approach to exercise and say, um, nobody does 100 to 150 RM. People probably don't even do 30 to 40 RM. Um, but if you do, you're probably going to incur a greater degree of discomfort. And that might mean that you don't reach true muscular failure. And that might mean that you don't make similar adaptations. Um, so I think that it's just worth kind of having that, that part added in. So, yeah, absolutely. Um, so basically in this one, there's just a lot of confounders, it would seem from what I, from what I'm, I'm seeing here. Um, yeah. And, and at the end of this, you said about how, uh, load doesn't really matter. Just train to failure, I think, and towards the end of hyper, hypertrophic adaptations. So that's just yeah. really kind of beating that drum, yeah. Yeah, I think that's kind of what we get into. Um, and, and, and you know, one of the key things that's worth looking at, and we originally talked about the paper by, I think it was by Matter et al., by Jeremy Lernecki's group, um, which looked at the practicing yeah. the test. And he had one group of participants um, perform, literally perform a one rep max or a maximal effort uh, bench press. I think they did five maximal effort bench presses per workout and the other group did um maybe four sets of eight to 12 reps and both groups improved to a similar degree in strength which suggests that the load doesn't make a difference to strength what they actually also found was that hypertrophy was greater for the higher volume group for the four sets of eight to 12 so one of the things that we kind of say in this is that load is probably not not a key driver in hypertrophy. And, um, you know, the, the hit crowd are going to hate me for this. But I think that volume is probably more important for hypertrophy um, than load. Um, and I don't know how important. I don't know whether, 
you know, we could say that a single set gets you 99% of the way and the other two sets or three sets or four sets get you that extra 1% or whether a single set gets you 80% of the way. Um, but certainly that, that paper by Mattox has tended to show um, a higher volume. We actually removed it from this discussion. Yeah. Um, based on a reviewer's comment um, because they were right it you know it, it didn't really have good application here but it, but it ultimately the key thing we're talking about here is load heavy moderate and light loads and how that impacts strength hypertrophy and muscular endurance and i think that the research is now just so you know um so clear that within a certain margin um heavy or light loads produce similar adaptations in strength, hypertrophy, and muscular endurance. Um, mic drop. <laughs> with, my, my, yeah, mic drop. Well, I was going to say, with the exception, with the exception <laughs> that if you're a weightlifter or somebody looking to improve strength in a specific exercise, then we can't discount the skill element of that exercise and of the motor unit recruitment. So if you're, Lawrence, if your sole aim was to improve your bench press one repetition max, there's no question that performing heavy bench presses at or close to your one repetition max is probably the best way to train because you're practicing exactly that process. Um, but even the paper by Mattox suggests that strength can be similar if you um if you use a, a different load and different volumes and, and so forth so and, and this is the issue right people and a lot of lay people especially uh, including myself probably a while back and uh, would have confounded um, relative strength with absolute strength right um in terms of what you said there in terms of like oh you know practicing a skill versus actually being stronger in it in in a in a absolute test yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, the difference between absolute and relative, like I said, your absolute, the, the best way to think of absolute muscular endurance is our body weight. Um, our body weight is subject to change. There's no question about it, but it's probably a relatively marginal change um, in, in comparison to other things. And as we improve our strength, so as somebody improves their bench press, if you were to take somebody who can bench press 20 kilos and somebody who can bench press 120 kilos, but yet they weigh the same, you know, you would expect the person that can bench press 120 kilos to perform more press-ups than the person that can only bench press 20 kilos. Um, and that's simply because they are stronger and therefore their absolute muscular endurance, their number of repetitions they can perform at their absolute load, which is their body weight in this case, is is greater. Um, yeah. So, you know, I, I think this is something that's really been, been you know, overlooked in, in a lot of this literature. And then the final section that we talk about in the paper is we, we even get into this idea of, you know, maximal strength. Um, people don't, in the real world, people don't really perform maximal strength efforts. Um, you know, if you're a power lifter, then you're absolutely going to do a, a maximal effort. If you are, if you go to the gym with the sole aim of improving the weight that you can lift in the gym, then you probably do a 1RM from time to time to see how much you can lift. But I don't remember the last time I did a 1RM because I know my strength increases if I can do more reps with the same load than I did last week. Mm -hmm. But arguably, that's not a good test of strength. It's only, or, or people would say it's not a good, good test of strength. They'd say it's only a test of muscular endurance. But that's my point, that muscular endurance is indicative of maximal strength. Um, yeah. And the, the example that we give in this paper is the um, 225 pound bench press for the NFL combine. That's a hundred kilo bench press. And before they are, you know, drafted by NFL teams, the athletes, the collegiate athletes go through the NFL combine test, um, one of which is this bench press, but they're not asked to do a one RM. They're just asked to see how many times they can bench press 225. Well, that's a test of absolute muscular endurance. Mm -hmm. So, um, 
you know, and then, and then, I've, you know, we talk about our own body weight and things like that, which, you know, from a, an exercise perspective lends itself to press ups, pull ups or dips, but it might be far more appropriate to think of it as, you know, getting out of a chair or climbing a flight of stairs or so forth. Um, and the other examples that we even gave, uh, which again were removed from this, were um, in older adults improving, you know, maximal strength, you know, leg press one rep max, they improve the time to fly, the time to um, walk up a flight of stairs. So, you know, that's, that's not a test of, you know, we've not had them practice walking up a flight of stairs. They've been, they've been practicing maximal strength by doing heavy load resistance training. But that improvement... So interesting. Sorry, go on, improve, yeah. yeah, but that improvement in strength identified by their leg press 1RM has actually produced an improvement in their ability to walk up a flight of stairs or walk up a flight of stairs quicker or so forth. So, yeah, you know, and that and that's really the, the again, that comes back to the practical element of all of this is, you know, if people train for what they can lift in a gym, and some people do, I had this conversation with Brad, um, I think it was Brad a while back, and I sort of said, you know, who really trains to lift, to see how much they can lift in a gym? Um, you know, surely people train for the more functional elements in the wider world. And, and Brad sort of stopped me and said, hold on, I know a lot of people that go to the gym to see how much they can lift in the gym. And so people clearly do that, but, you know, a minority uh, there, right well oh, they whether they're a minority or not they're a group of people and other people train for other reasons so yeah you know. it's uh, it's just fascinating because it's just for me it just builds a very strong case you know adds to the 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 body of evidence that high intensity strength training as performed in many of our our colleagues and uh facilities and, and hit studio owners around the world um, it's just like the, it's like, I know, I remember Doug putting it, Dr. Doug McGuff putting it, um, across as almost like shooting a swish. Uh, he's actually talking about something else, but it also applies here. It's like, you know, you're training with a moderate to heavy load. I'm sure James, you'd articulate as much better. Um, you know, for a reasonable, uh, time under loads, eight to 12 reps. I think one of your papers recommended, um, yeah. to muscular failure is like just optimal because or optimal is probably not the right word but it's just we know that it's going to have so many positive uh byproducts and adaptations and which are transferable in all these different modalities that you're talking about you know to know that someone's going to do and this is this is nothing new right this is stuff we've known for decades but like to or a lot of the hit practitioners have known for a long time um to, to know that you know you can do this you know leg press rows chin-ups and it be so transferable to every activity in life. But but the, the cool thing is that you guys actually, you know, do the hard work to put this research together to just underpin the um, validity of that approach, you know, which is ultimately, I guess, yeah. what you're, yeah. So sorry, go ahead. Yeah, and what's really interesting about that is I think the further to an extreme you move, so if, for example, you do 8 to 12 reps, you're, you're arguably, let's call it a moderate range, a moderate load, a moderate time under load, whatever it might be. If you move to doing one or two reps, maximal effort reps, you might see ultimately the same maximal strength improvements. But interestingly, it might have less application in the real world because you're focusing so much on the skill of that maximal recruitment you're focusing uh, you're focusing so much on maximal strength but not the morphological not the muscular element that you're potentially not making the same practical um improvements the same you know real world improvements that's purely hypothetical that's purely hypothetical <laughs> but but again this is where um you know training with a more moderate load is um can, can can clearly make the same maximal strength improvements and the same muscle hypertrophy improvements and the same muscular endurance improvements, but has, you know, what, what appears to be a very practical approach to, um, to, to life, to the real world setting of carrying shopping bags or walking upstairs or carrying a child or, you know, whatever it might be. Yeah. 
just just a couple more questions before we wrap up. Um, of course. What if what if have you had a response from the ACSM or NSCA or any of the authors of the papers you've criticised? No, no, not at all, and I wouldn't expect one. Uh, and there's a couple of reasons around that. First of all, we've I first submitted this paper back in 2018, mm-hmm. uh, and it went. I submitted it to. Um, uh, well, I'm, I'm just I'm not going to name the journals, but a number of high impact journals um, where it would have gone to uh, to reviewers to be looked over and it was reviewed. Um, and the general uh, problem seemed to be that it, it um, or my perspective seemed to be that it, it challenged the existing kind of paradigm far too much. And people were just simply not comfortable with it. Um, now arguably it maybe wasn't as well written or it wasn't as clear and certainly the comments that we got back have improved the quality of the manuscript so uh, you know if i'm positive about the review experience they've helped to improve the quality of what this manuscript is but ultimately we reached a point where where we were sick of kind of submitting this to higher level journals um, and getting the same kind of response of well we've known for decades that heavy loads improve strength. So who do you think you are to challenge this? Um, And so in the end, we went to this journal that it's published in, which is called Journal of uh, Trainology, which is, um, you know, let's not deny it, a low level um, journal compared to the others. It certainly doesn't have an impact factor and it's not cited on the usual places like PubMed. Um, But the great thing about it is it's open access it still goes through a peer review process. So it's still a rigorous peer review. Um, But by being open access, it means, you know, anybody can read it anytime and it's freely available. There's no charges to to access the manuscript. Can you reveal who peer reviewed it? I have no idea. Peer review is a blind process. Peer review is a blind process, yeah. Yeah. I thought you know after the fact. I thought you would know eventually. with, With some journals, you can find out after the fact, yeah. With some journals, the reviewer is even cited uh, in the yeah. um, column on the side of the manuscript to say who was the editor who um, who was responsible for kind of accepting it or kind of putting it forward to review. And even the reviewers are listed. Um, and the journals that do that, Frontiers do that, and um, Peer J do that. And, you know, and they're, they're, they're what I would consider forward thinking journals. For this, because I think it's really important that a reviewer is responsible for their comments. Yeah, um, I'm. Yeah, I, I agree completely. And um, I'm sad. I mean, it's great that you were able to get it in a journal, but I'm really sad to hear that. It sounds like an old boys' club, like you know these other journals that are really prestigious. Um, and that is just so antithetical that type of response to the scientific method in my opinion, um, and the good work you guys have done, which is, you know, rigorous from what I'm looking at. So I, I'm quite disappointed in that. Do you think that could, do you feel the same? And do you think that might change over time? Um, well, I mean, one of the other things that's worth mentioning is this is written as a commentary. And a lot of journals aren't really keen on publishing commentaries because okay. they, they, they're deemed to have less kind of scientific rigor. So I mentioned at the start of this podcast that we're doing, we're in the process of doing a systematic review. Um, on the same so, topic, is it? On the same topic. Oh, so cool. we're going to, so we're going through the entire body of literature that's looked at uh, where, where there are training studies which have measured strength and hypertrophy, or sorry, and or hypertrophy and or muscular endurance. Um, and we will, you know, publish a systematic review on that. And we will, we will go to the higher impact journals for that. And it will hopefully get published in those journals because it's a different kind of, um, scientific process um but but at the same time it was a bit disappointing to think that or it is disappointing to think that there might be a bit of a an old boys club that you know we've built we've built up this um you know foundation of a strength endurance continuum and we don't want some guys to come along and knock it down yeah exactly Um, yeah jeremy Jeremy Lenecki does a great job of challenging kind of things like periodization and and general adaptation syndrome and um and and is incredibly academic in the way he does it and gets published in um in some very good journals with that 
So maybe it's the way that he's a better writer than I am or than we are um, or a better process in that. Um, you know, so uh, but he then, you know, does does deal with the kind of responses um, from the other authors who, you know, disapprove of somebody challenging their um, their life's work. He's got so, a bit uh, of a bite, Jeremy has, actually. <laughs> you know it's it's endearing. I've got the utmost respect for this guy. He's just yeah. one of the he's an incredibly intelligent guy, oh, really, yeah. really nice guy to be around, really easy to chat to. And um yeah, just a, a great academic and researcher and is doing a great job in challenging some some things. Um, you know, like I said, similar to this in periodization and whatnot. Um, and the link between strength and hypertrophy in a really in, in actually a really diplomatic way. So I I find it frustrating when people get so uh, defensive that they're being challenged because he does it in such a a, a nice way almost. <laughs> yeah, he does. He does. He's uh, he does it very well. Um, you know, so the the systematic review then is that your your main focus in your research group going at the moment? Is it? Um, yeah, it's something that um, Pak uh, Patroclus Andrulakis Korakakis, the third author on this paper. He's one of it's our a mouthful of that name, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. He's a, he's a great guy, powerlifter from <laughs> from Greece. Uh, he's a PhD student of mine and James Steele's, and he's um, leading that systematic review. Um, so, you know, I would look to get that yeah. hopefully submitted at some point this year and published this year or next. That's, um, that sounds great. Excited yeah. to uh, so, but, but, take a look. But at I it. think that most, I'm going to say, young academics you know, are now far more aware of the body of literature that shows similar strength, hypertrophy and endurance adaptations, irrespective of load. Yeah. So, um, yeah. I'm, uh, I'm aware of time, uh, but I, I, I guess if you've got a moment, James, um, do you have any, any parting words or thoughts about how this impacts programming for the, the practitioner? Yeah, well, I mean, the main thing, like, I, you know, I, I linked to sort of periodization there and, and, and the work of, of Jeremy. So I think that once we take away this idea that you train for specific, specifically for strength, hypertrophy or endurance, it, it then adds to this idea of kind of debunking periodization um, where people, you know, have specific training goals for specific um, times. Um so, so again, I think it just simplifies resistance training. And I think it kind of says to the triathlete as a prime example of an endurance athlete or the bodybuilder or the, you know, powerlifter, actually more moderate loads or heavy loads or lighter loads aren't, you know, necessarily um, more efficacious or more detrimental to your training you can really sort of self-select load and and in under the current circumstances of kind of social distancing and gym closures with covid19 i think one of the key things that this paper lends itself to is that you know training with a lighter load um that most people would think is in, indicative of muscular endurance a lighter load and higher repetitions is not the end of the world. It might not be great fun. Uh, it might be far less comfortable than training with a heavy load. But actually, if we get to muscular failure, it's probably going to do just as much for strength and hypertrophy as training with a heavy load or a heavier load might have done. So I think that it's it, it kind of adds a degree of freedom to our training that we can choose the load based on how we feel on that, that day. Well said, James. Thank you so much for your time today. Really appreciate it. Um, what's the best way for people to contact you and find out more about you? Yeah, the best thing to do is send me an email. It's james.fisher at solent. That's S O L E N T dot A C dot U K. And uh, I'll, get, I'll get back to you uh, as and when I can. Um, but yeah, just send me an email with any questions. More than happy to share the paper or um, discuss the content or um, you know, be challenged or be questioned by people. So. Yeah, it's a good point. You meant you brought that up actually. The paper will obviously be linked in the show notes to this, so you can actually flick through the paper as you listen to to James and I discuss that. And to find that blog post for this episode and also download the PDF transcript, please go to highintensitybusiness.com and search for episode 269. And until next time, thank you very much for listening. 
Discover how to achieve your health and fitness goals, become a great personal trainer, and build a successful high-intensity training business. Check out highintensitybusiness.com. Highintensitybusiness.com. This episode is brought to you by ARX, the most innovative, efficient, and effective all-in-one exercise machines I have ever seen. I was really impressed with my ARX workout. The intensity and adaptive resistance was unlike anything I've ever experienced. I love how the machine enables you to increase the negative load to fatigue target muscles more quickly. And I love how the workouts are effortlessly quantified. The software tracks maximum force output, rate of work, total amount of work done and more in front of you on screen, allowing you to compete with your previous performance to give you and your clients real-time motivation. The ARX uses a computer-controlled motor to give you the exact amount of resistance your clients need 100% of the time. This means that the resistance can never become dangerous, is intuitive and simple to use, and can provide you with all of the results you and your clients are looking for in a fraction of the time. ARX is highly effective and efficient in delivering all of the benefits of exercise, including increased strength, muscle mass, cardiovascular conditioning, bone mineral density, and injury recovery. As well as being utilized by many high-intensity trainers to deliver highly effective and efficient workouts to their clients, ARX comes highly recommended by world-class trainers and brands, including Bulletproof, Tony Robbins, and Ben Greenfield Fitness. To find out more about ARX and get $500 off install when you place an order, please go to arxfit.com and mention HIB, that's High Intensity Business, in the How Did You Hear About Us field. So again, to get $500 off install when you place an order, head on over to arxfit.com and enter HIB in the How Did You Hear About Us field. 